a look back on the Tennessee Volunteers 2022 season, a crossover edition with our buddy Eric Kane. What were some of the most special moments of the year for the Vols, and can they do it again next season? Locked on uh, SEC starts right now. You are locked on SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's happening, everybody? Welcome into Locked On SEC. Happy to have you guys here with us. And uh, before we get started with Eric Kane, just want to remind you guys, uh, tomorrow's show, we're going to talk all things recruiting and transfer portal with John Garcia Jr. We'll uh, get caught up as the transfer portal. Uh, the initial phase of it has closed. It will reopen again after uh, spring ball. So looking forward to that episode and also wanted to pass along the news that, uh, according to Football Scoop, uh, Kendall Bryles is expected to be hired as TCU's new offensive coordinator. So that means both OC and DC that uh, Sam Pittman's going to have to replace there at Arkansas. So uh, we'll certainly keep you up to date on all the latest news there with uh, coaching hires and all that kind of stuff. Without further ado, let's throw it to our buddy Eric Kane, host of Locked on Vols. We did a little crossover this week looking back on the Tennessee Volunteers 2022 season. Enjoy. But I want to talk a lot of, obviously, Tennessee football, kind of the highs, the lows, and then hit it from a bigger perspective around the SEC. And no better guy to have this conversation with than the guy that covers the entire SEC for the Locked On Podcast Network. That is Chris Gordy. Chris, what's up, man? Yo, what's up, Eric? How are you, man? I'm good, man. Appreciate you hanging out with me here today. And, you know, when we when we discuss, you know, Tennessee football for 2022, I don't think anybody, myself included, you know, saw 11 wins. <laughs> I don't think anybody saw uh, a near Heisman finalist or a Blitnikoff Award winner or beating uh, Alabama or destroying LSU on the road, just kind of stuff like that. I mean, your overall thoughts now a couple weeks out from the end of the regular season, of course, the Orange Bowl victory on who and what Tennessee football was in 2022. Yeah, they were um, they were a little bit better than I thought. Um, you know, if you go back and listen to some of my projections from the summer, uh, you know, I think even at SEC Media Days, I said, you know, I thought Tennessee and Kentucky both had a chance to go ten and two, and have special seasons just because of you know what they were bringing back. Uh, I didn't know losing Liam Cohen would hurt Kentucky as much as it did. Uh, we saw Will Levis kind of regress and not be as good as he was the year prior. I mean, they had Chris Rodriguez and all these pieces. So Kentucky clearly didn't live up to that, to that expectation that I had, but I thought 10 and two was truly in play. If everything went well and I had high expectations for Hendon hooker and, you know, I kind of thought Alabama and Georgia would be their two losses. They, they got the monkey off their back. They beat Alabama. Uh, of course you, and I think everybody, nobody could foresee the loss at South Carolina coming, but, you know, they were kind of, that was kind of like, I, I said ceiling was 10 and two, and that's exactly what they did. And then granted, you know, cherry on the top, you go to the bowl game and you beat a top seven Clemson team that, you know, still had a really good defense and you did it with your backup quarterback. And, you know, I just think that does so much for you setting the tone going into next year with Joe Milton executing the offense and looking so good. It's just going to give you all that goodwill going into the off season. But overall, man, it, it was a hell of a ride. And I think you're a Vol fan. You got to be so so happy and pleased with what happened this season. I think that win against Bama will live on for years and years and years. We'll we'll see the images and the video of the kid sitting on the goalpost riding it as everybody's <laughs> taking it out the stadium. But um, yeah, I, to me, that's the big moment of the year that will stand out. But don't discount. I mean, the win against Florida was was big. You know, when they're trying to come back, you thought you had them, and then here they come back. Mm -hmm. The overtime win at Pitt was outstanding. And then I think even that Kentucky team, because Kentucky was still top 20 when you played them, and you beat their brains in. I think that was outstanding. Uh, you know, the exclamation points to just beat down Mizzou and beat down Vanderbilt were, were nice. So overall, man, an awesome season. And if you're a Vol fan, how can you not be excited about what's to come? Was there ever a point this past season, and this might come as a silly question because Tennessee debuted at number one in the college football playoff rankings, Tennessee – uh, was up there and was undefeated and, you know, had those uh, monstrous wins that we're discussing right now. But was there ever a moment where you truly thought Tennessee could win the national championship? And, and if so, when was it? I mean, obviously, you know, for me, 
everybody looks back at that Alabama game. Sure, I mean, Florida was impressive. LSU was super impressive. But when you survived, I say survived, I mean, you know, you, you did survive because you led the entire game up until that fumbled exchange and the scoop and score there towards the end. You you take, you take took down Alabama. And, and once I finally got out of the swamp on the field, you know, shooting video, and I was leaving the stadium that night, I mean, I did think to myself, I was like, this is crazy. Tennessee can actually win a national championship this year. That was the moment for me. Was it similar for you, or did you ever think that – Tennessee would did you think that Tennessee still had a hurdle to pass with Georgia or anything like that yeah obviously the the beating beating Florida and then beating Alabama and, and the win at LSU let's not discount that one I thought that was that was a monster win in, in demolishing them the way you did um but I thought it was really that the, the win at Kentucky to finish on off October on Halloween weekend you demolish them in the fashion you did I just felt like, man, that momentum sitting there at eight and zero, going into Athens. You know, I, I'm a sports better. I bet on Tennessee to win that day. I really thought, you know, I, I, I two bets I made that day. One, one, one did not. One, I had LSU to beat Alabama. The other one, I had Tennessee to beat Georgia. I thought both were going to happen, and I thought we were going to be talking about an LSU Tennessee SEC championship game in Atlanta. Like I really thought that that was coming. And, um, you know, you just think about what could have happened that day. And I know the, the, the game just didn't go their way at all, right? I mean, the you know, the, the short yardage, they weren't able to keep drives alive. Hendon Hooker just did not look like himself. The offense didn't execute. And then the rain at the back end of the game just made things worse. So any chance of a comeback just kind of felt like, eh, they're not going to be able to do this. But that, that was really the turning point. But going into that week, I really did. I thought they were going to find a way to win an ugly game at Georgia, just get out with a win, 21-20 or something like that. And then I think, you know, maybe the domino effect, right? Like maybe if they're undefeated, they don't lose at South Carolina. They don't lay an egg that week. Um, you know, and then we're talking about them going to an SEC title game where they're probably going to beat uh, LSU again in a rematch and be undefeated and probably, you know, would have been the one seed in the, in the playoff when it's all said and done. But, you know, that said, even after the loss to Georgia, I think we still were looking at it and going, all right, some things fall their way. They'll be the four seed. And lo and behold, they would have been like, or, or the three, seed. like they would have been in the playoff. if They just would have taken care of business against South Carolina. And I think that was frustrating. If you're a Vol fan to see TCU go to the title game, um, you know, would it have been a rematch? Would you have to, would you have gotten beaten by Georgia again? <laughs> you know, Maybe, but um, yeah, that was, that was the point that like, to me, after you beat up Kentucky and you're undefeated going into Athens, I just felt like, man, this team has got a real chance to, to win a national championship this year. And uh, again, like you play George in their house, you don't play well, you realize we're close, but we're not there yet. That's why I kept saying preseason that I was picking them 10 and two, because I kept saying they're close, but they're not there yet. They're not on Batman George's level yet, but they'll get there. And um Again, you know, it's still, I don't want to take anything away. It was a fantastic season, and this is a great foundational piece. It's a stepping stone. But I, I hopefully the guys that are coming back, at least, they have the confidence knowing, hey, man, we could play with anybody anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, South Carolina. <laughs> I was, you know, you know, doing a long time crossover that week, and, you know, me and Andrew both were just like, yeah, Tennessee's going to win by 21, 25. And, again, that's why you play football. And then the next week, you know, after the comments from Dabo Sweeney, you know, they can't take care of business against South Carolina. It's just, that's football. It's it's frustrating, but unfortunately that is football. Um, You know, last thing here in this segment, before we do look ahead and talk about the 2023 volunteers, um, I mean, Josh Heupel's got to be, I'm trying to say this as unbiased as possible. I know I cover the program, but I mean, Josh Heupel's got to be one of the best stories and one of the best arcs so far uh, in college football. I mean, what he's done in two years, again, when he took over, where the program was, NCAA violations, losing 30-plus to the transfer portal, what he inherited. Um, I mean, what a job he and his staff have done in two years. Uh, you know, Tennessee's thought they've had the guy a couple of times since Philip Former. I mean, they, they might have this guy right here in Josh Heupel coming off this 11-2 and two year in year number two. Yeah, and, and nothing against the previous guy. But, you know, I, th I think we kept looking and going, I think they need an offensive-minded coach. And my buddy who's a big Vol, Vol fan said – you know, when they hired uh, Heupel, you know, there were a lot of naysayers. There were a lot of people who were like, yeah, it's kind of whatever. I don't really like the hire. But I think, you know, even him and, and even the most pessimistic fall fan said, well, at least the offenses will be more entertaining. Because, God, yeah. some of those games with Jared Garantano, like, good God, like, just put a, you know, stick in your brain. Like, it just, <laughs> it was so painful to watch. So, you know, the hope was, and, and we saw it very quickly when Heupel took over. You're like, all right, well, look. 
at least they're going to score some points. We're going to lose still, but we're going to score some points. So we're going to be entertaining. And I think that's the challenge for him now going into year three. We did see some really good performances from the defense this year, but can they take that next step? You know, getting some pieces in through the transfer portal and all that. I think the evolution of, of, of hype, and we know you're great offensively, and I expect uh, Joey Halsley will, will pick up right where Alex Golish left off, and we're going to see, you know, won't see a drop off from, from the play calling in that OC spot, and I think you're going to be just fine offensively. It's can that defense continue to improve? And you don't need an elite level defense, but you just need a, a good to pretty darn good defense. And I think the the, the Vols are in, in business. More with Chris Gordy coming up next, and we'll talk about those 2023 volunteers, the expectations, the defense, and the new offense anchored and quarterbacked by Joe Milton. That's coming up next right here on your Wednesday Locked On Vols. Bet Online, it's your number one source for all your sports betting news, information, analysis, all that good stuff this season. You can uh, get all the latest odds for every professional league out there, whether it's the NFL, the NFL playoffs happening right now, whether it's college basketball, SEC schedules in full swing. You have uh, you know NBA, of course, the World Cup a few months ago, college football wrapped up with the national championship uh, last week. You can find all those at betonline.net. Sports podcasts as well, like the one you're listening to. You can check that out at, Check that out after you listen to Locked On Vols. That is the rule, but do check those out. And there's always the fastest and easiest way to get all your sports betting information, spreads, totals, over, unders, first half props, third quarter props, whatever you want. They have it all at betonline.net, and a great time to check all those out with the uh, NFL playoffs happening right now. Head on over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn about all the latest trends and all the action. It's Bet Online, where the game starts. Locked on Vols, I'm your host, Eric Kane. Got Chris Gordy of Locked on SEC joining us here today. We were looking at the 2022 Tennessee Volunteers, the highs, and a couple of the, or really the, the low was, you know, South Carolina. But looking ahead to 2023, now, what does Tennessee have expectation-wise for you? And I understand this is January. I understand there's more transfer portal action to be had in the second window. Spring practice has not started yet. There is a lot to be determined. But when you think of Tennessee in 2023, kind of what's your viewpoint right now, nine months out? Well, the first thing I go to is the schedule. And, you know, you get Virginia right out of the gates at Nissan Stadium. And and I don't know what Virginia's going to look like, right? New quarterback, just a whole lot of new pieces. But that's one that you feel like Tennessee's in a better spot. They should win that one. Uh, you get Austin P at Florida. Again, Florida's in transition. Billy Napier, I think, is going to be a good coach down the road. But he's got a lot of things he's got to figure out. And I know that's a tough place to play. But that just feels like one Tennessee, you're – you're ahead of where Florida is right now, your program. That's one you cannot lose. UTSA is an interesting one. UTSA has been a very competitive team these last couple of years. They've won a lot of games uh, over in that conference. And so, like, that's not going to be one you could take lightly. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. You told me right now that's a game, you know, Tennessee wins by 7 or 10. Like, I'd be like, yeah, UTSA is a really good team. So, that's one not to take lightly. Uh, you get South Carolina in Knoxville. I know he's coming back. Spencer Rattler announced he's coming back. So the good Peyton news Manning, is what? I mean, yeah. the good news he, is he, got, hey, on that day he was. I mean, goodness gracious. The good news is you got film on him, so you can go back <laughs> and you know see where he picked you apart a year ago. They didn't get the bye. They didn't get a And M, but you get him in Knoxville. And I, look, the Bobby Petrino thing. I don't know if that's if that could work wonders for a And M. It could be an absolute disaster. I lean right now towards maybe it's a disaster to type A personalities. <laughs> yeah. But that said, this is going to be the best talent that uh, Petrino's ever coached. He's never had all these four and five stars that AM has. So maybe it works. So maybe that's that's one that could be very difficult for the Ags. At Bama's tough. And at Kentucky's going to be tough. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, them bringing back Liam Cohen with Devin Leary coming over from NC State. They're getting Raymond Davis from Vanderbilt. Uh, KV on, uh, Tavion Robinson announced he's coming back. Like, Kentucky will be a factor next year. That That is definitely one, you know, what was the score this year? A million to, to six. Like, you will not blow them out like you did this past year at Kentucky. I think the offensive line will get better. Uh, UConn, another decent, like, you know, team that's really leaps and bounds uh, better than they were a couple years ago. That said, you get them at home. You sh sh should still beat them. At Missouri is always that tough one, right? They're always that thorn in your side. Like, you can never take Missouri lightly because, you know, the, the one year you do, they'll jump up and bite you. But again, feel like they should win that one. I think there's a good chance, and I'm just going to chalk it up and say they lose at Alabama just because it's so difficult to lose in Tuscaloosa. Like just kind of running through the schedule, 
I think there's a chance the Vols are a one-loss team going uh, into the Georgia game. And my God, you got them in Knoxville. This is your chance. They get, they're going to have a new quarterback. They're going to have a whole lot of new pieces to figure out. Granted, that's a very talented team. It just won 65-7 to seven in the national championship. <laughs> but I think there's a great shot that if Tennessee is, is a one-loss team in that game, you lose to Bama, but you find a way to beat Georgia, you beat Vanderbilt to finish the season, you're going to Atlanta next year. So it's it's on the table. It's there. Again, a lot can change. You could you could mess up and lose any one of those other 50-50 games I talked about, but uh, I just playing it out in my head when I looked at the schedule, I said, that's a game where I think Georgia will be undefeated because their schedule is a joke next year. I think Georgia will be undefeated going into that game, but that is absolutely for the rights to go to Atlanta and win the SEC East. So Chris Gordy said Tennessee could win 10 games in 2022. Tennessee won 10 games in the regular season. Chris Gordy says Tennessee could win 11 games in the regular season in 2023. So, hey, maybe I discredited this guy back in the summer. I, you know, maybe, maybe we should look more into let, this. Let me see what the defense looks like in the spring <laughs> first, Eric. Let's see, let's see what they look like. Not only with the defense, but in order to win 10, 11 games, in order to play competitively and win eight, nine games and, and, and look impressive on the offensive end, you've, you've got to have good quarterback play. I mean, Tennessee's returning a lot of talent. It's returning three starters on the offensive line. It's entire backfield. Uh, it's returning talent at wide receiver, even though you're losing Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman. But Cedric Tillman didn't really even factor in much this season, about half the games. You got to have good quarterback play. Joe Milton, um, he's been in college since the Reagan administration. He was Tennessee's starting quarterback in 2021, but lost that job after six quarters and an injury. Uh, but in mop up duty this year, he looked good. In the Orange Bowl, I mean, I'll be first. I'll be the first to say it. I picked Clemson to win the Orange Bowl because I did not think Joe Milton would be good enough. He was phenomenal in the Orange Bowl. Uh, consistency at the quarterback coaching position. Now the OC and Alex uh, and uh, Joey Halsey. Halsley. What are your expectations for Joe Milton now in his sixth collegiate season? I mean, the guy's got to be, what, 25? Stetson Bennett age potentially next year. Well, we finally saw him with a little touch on his throws. And that was, I mean, he, this guy was throwing missiles, um, you know, in his, in his first couple of years in Knoxville and overthrowing guys. I mean, like guys running wide open and he can't connect with them because he's overthrowing them. Overthrow I, Joe, baby. Yeah, I mean, Bazooka Joe, whatever they want to call him. Like, he is... Uh, we started to see a little bit more touch on the passes. And so now bringing back Drew McCoy, I think is, is, is big squirrel white obviously showed him and, you know, him and Milton are on the same page in the bowl game. Dante Thornton to me is, you know, when we talk about all the biggest additions to the transfer portal this off season so far, you know, I, I'm going to put Dante Thornton as like on my top 10 list of transfers coming into the sec this year. I just think he's a guy that can be a difference maker for them and really, you know, add some speed to that spot um, to this offense. And I, th I just give me that trio alone. I know they got the with the tight end McCallum Castles out of UC Davis. Like, uh, you know, we'll see what the other pieces look like. But just those three guys alone, I think, is a really, really good start for Joe Milton to develop chemistry with throughout the spring and then into the fall. And um, look, you know, we'll always love Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman, and those guys were outstanding, but. I think you're going to turn the page and and you're going to like these guys just as much. You know, Tennessee lost three slot receivers from the roster. Of course, Jalen Hyatt's going to the NFL. Uh, you had uh, Jimmy Callaway and Squirrel, uh, not, not Squirrel, what, Jimmy Callaway and Walker Merrill, who can play slot. They left via the transfer portal. So really, Tennessee's got one slot receiver on campus right now. That's Squirrel White. Dante Thornton is a slot receiver as well, can play slot, but, you know, I – Ramel Keaton, what a great story, and we'll talk about this all, all off season. But I'm with you. It's Brew McCoy on one side, it's Dante Thornton on the other because he's six foot four and a half, two hundred, long, explosive, and then Squirrel in the middle. If Squirrel goes down, you can move Thornton to the inside, then bring up Ramel Keaton. I mean, that's it's a good problem to have if you are Tennessee. Uh, lastly, you mentioned a couple of those additions via the transfer portal. Obviously, Dante Thornton's going to be the biggest one. But what do you know about John Campbell, if anything? Um, you, and you might not. I mean, you, you can only keep track of so many players. But John Campbell, an offensive tackle from Miami. Uh, Tennessee's bringing him in to try to play. And when you're trying to replace Darnell Wright, which is unfair, it's probably not going um, to happen. You You need to be able to supplement that loss in order to keep up with the rest of the offenses around the country. I think Tennessee's hoping that Andre Kirick from Texas can play guard and and John Campbell can play one of those tackle spots to really help this offense go. 
Yeah, uh, I've seen a little bit of film on him. Big physical guy. Um, yeah, I, I think plug and play. I think he should come over and 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 start start immediately and, and address that need. But uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine who who covers Texas, and he was telling me don't discount Andre Carrick. That he's a guy that can come in and and play and and expect to 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 you know try to start from day one too. So I think the great additions there. I think they're not done. You know, obviously you you lose Jerome Carvin. You know, RG Perry's following. Uh, goalish over to usf but i think uh you know if, if everything hits right maybe maybe this offensive line is is just as good as this past year maybe it maybe a tick not as good but like again i think that's just incumbent on dialing up the right plays for joe milton getting that ball out of his hands um you know i always go back to that 2019 lsu team it's so funny uh that offensive line was named you know the best the best offensive line in the country they won the award for best joe line Mario. but they were not the best offensive line. If you watch those games, Joe Burrow made the throws and got rid of the ball to make them look good. You know, uh, same thing with Drew Brees in New Orleans for so many years. The, those uh, alignment from the Saints would make the Pro Bowl. It's like, well, they're good, but he made them look good because he got rid of the ball and avoided sacks and all that kind of stuff. And so, I always go back to that. You know, when you have a guy like Joe Milton, um, you know, how how does the offense adapt and and can they get the ball out of his hands? And that's where you said, like, who who's my slot guy? Who's my safety valve that? I can dump it off when the rush is coming, um, but we'll see. You know, again, we got all spring to go through. We'll see what this offensive line looks like, and who knows? I mean, if if they if they strike gold with these guys, if Campbell comes in and he's mauling guys, maybe it's a chance the old line's better than the one this year. Because granted, as good as they were this year, they had times where they they didn't protect and they didn't look good. So uh, we'll see. That's why I'm excited to see what this this team looks like throughout the spring. Last thing I'll say on, on Tennessee in 2023, kind of looking ahead, I think this is going to be a theme here on Locked On Balls throughout the offseason. I think Tennessee's defense is going to be good next year. And I know a lot of people will just continue to be hung up on the secondary, and, and rightfully so, and hung up on the South Carolina game, and rightfully so, so. But if you check a stat sheet for 2022 Tennessee's defense, it ain't bad. It, it, it's honestly not bad. Can it be much better in areas? Absolutely. But it's not bad. You compare Tennessee's 2022 defense, Tennessee's 2021 defense. Hey, you're you're seeing a big step, and I think Tennessee will take another step defensively and be a pretty daggone good unit next year. So let me ask you real quick, Eric. Out of uh, Caleb Herring, Arian Carter, uh, Jalen Smith, which of the incoming recruits do you think can have the biggest impact next year? Um, on defense, I would say probably David Hobbs, five-star defensive lineman. Of course, Rodney Gardner plays a huge rotation, so I think in order for him to get in there and just you know get, gain his trust, but he he's a guy that I think can have a role next year on the defensive front. Um, Tennessee obviously is lo- losing Byron Young, but it's returning Roman Harrison and um, Joshua Josephs and James Pierce, who play that Leo spot already. So I, I don't know if they're going to rush a Davion Bradley or Caleb Herring, even though I think those will be good players. Maybe a John Slaughter in the secondary. Tennessee's linebacker room is a little interesting too because Juwan Mitchell hits the portal. He's been here. Um, he's been in college for a while as well, uh, like Joe Milton. Um, and then you lose Jeremy Banks of the NFL. You bring back Aaron Beasley. You go out and get Keenan Peely at linebacker from BYU. So you got two veterans, and then you lose Solon Page because he played six years. You have two veterans, and you have all these young guys like Elijah Herring and Caleb Perry, who was the, here this year, and then those freshmen you mentioned. It's a nice mixture. You're gonna you're gonna need those two veterans to really develop those young guys so maybe an Aaron Carter will have somewhat of a role at linebacker next year uh, I'm intrigued but I think it's it's going to be more on the defensive side of the football than anything on the offensive side of the football I mean the, the game plan the hope is Nico's not playing this year I think that's what everybody hopes but you know we'll see we know how football is none of those <laughs> offensive linemen coming in will start next year uh, Nathan Laycock might be a guy that gets a run at receiver a little bit but you know, we'll just kind of have to see, but a lot of off-season conversation for Tennessee in that regard, and that'll happen all between now and uh, you know September first when Tennessee kicks off. What I want to know from you, Chris, when we come back, what about the rest of the SEC? Florida's quarterback room is uh, kind of up and down at the time of this recording. Of course, LSU, you're familiar with that program. Alabama, Georgia. What about the rest of the SEC looking ahead? That's coming up next right here on Locked On Balls. More with Eric in just a second, but first I want to remind you guys about our friends over at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, you got to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and a lot of you, I know your goal is to lead a, eat a little bit healthier this year. You got to try Built. Built Bars are healthy and tasty, perfect for your New Year's resolution. 
they are covered in 100% real chocolate. They come in unbelievable flavors. Peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, churro. It tastes just like a candy bar, but is actually good for you. Over, uh, only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein packed in there. And you don't have to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been telling you about ordering built bars at built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head on over to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can do the same thing at Sam's Club or, of course, get them the traditional way over at Built.com. You can thank us later. Go to Built.com right now. Try your Built Bar. It is your Wednesday Locked On Vols. I am Eric Kane, and I've got Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC here with me today. We're looking at big picture stuff for Tennessee and, of course, around the SEC. Uh, go ahead and listen to Locked On SEC as well. Chris does an awesome job, gets really, really good interviews. I say this all the time. Uh, but when you're done listening to Locked On Ball, check out Locked On SEC. Make that your second listen uh, each and every day. Chris, um, looking around the SEC, any big changes in terms of the the, the powers next year? I mean, like, is Georgia and Alabama still going to be Georgia, Alabama? Is LSU going to take a step and continue to be a pretty solid team? Of course, it went to Atlanta this year. We already know your thoughts on Tennessee. Kind of big picture SEC. Who were your contenders, and is there any big time movements uh, you're expecting for 2023? Yeah, I mean the very early just glance glimpse of of what you're looking at when you look at the SEC as a whole next year is yeah, I think it's going to be Bam and Georgia again. You know, as the favorites in the East and the West, but I do think that gap is closing a little bit. With and I'd put LSU and Tennessee right there knocking on the door. Um, you know, there's a path. We just ran through it with with Tennessee next year. That if they beat Georgia in Athens, or, or rather in Knoxville, that that Tennessee is going to Atlanta. Um, you know, LSU has to uh, go to Tuscaloosa next year, which again I always say is just you almost always just chalk it up as a loss because they never lose at home. But I think that's a spot where if LSU can can find a way to win that one, and they're getting Jane Daniels back, they got the hardest part figured out. They're bringing back their quarterback. Uh, I think there's a path for LSU to win the West. Again. I was just googling that, by the way. I don't mean to cut you. I was literally just googling. I was like, Jaden Daniels coming yeah. back, and, he, yeah, he and then just you made, said, and that's good for LSU. He made the announcement. Yeah, and look, to, you know, there were times where he was hesitant and didn't throw the deep ball. That Tennessee game was the was the epitome of it. It was where he had guys and he was just holding it too long and wouldn't let it go. As the season went along, he got more comfortable doing that. That's why I think had they played Tennessee later in the year, they probably would have put up a better fight than they did earlier. But, um, you know, he was still learning that Florida State game where they lose by the the extra missed extra point. They were still feeling each other out. He hadn't had many practices with Kayshawn Booty and all these different pieces that they had. So him just another year being comfortable in the Mike Denbrock system under Brian Kelly and just straight up development and evolution. I think Jane Daniels is going to get even better this year. So um, to me, like when we're talking about the West race, LSU's got the hardest part figured out. They know who their quarterback is. Bama's got Bama's losing a ton to the draft. Like I know they're all excited about a great recruiting class and all that, but like, show me a list of how many eighteen-year-old true freshmen have a have a huge impact year in and year out in the SEC. I mean, there's guys who contribute. You know, Malachi Starks had a nice year at Georgia. Uh, shoot the championship game the other night. Bear Alexander and Michael mm-hmm. Williams were really good. Georgia's looking pretty good in the true freshman department, but like. Just like it's so hard to make an immediate impact. And you can tell me Alabama's going to turn around and lean on a bunch of 18 year old freshmen next year. I think it's just not going to go well. I mean, they got to figure out the quarterback spot very quickly. Are they going to roll with Jalen Nora, who was a mixed bag? I mean, there were sometimes he looked good, there were sometimes he didn't look good. Uh, is it going to be Ty Simpson or is it going to be one of these incoming freshmen? I really thought Alabama was going to go to the transfer portal and go get a veteran quarterback to bring in. I think uh, George is going to be just fine. I, I think they like their their room of Brock Vandergriff. And I mean, they, they've got, they've got a lot of talented guys who may actually be more talented than Stetson Bennett. If we're just talking. Oh, 100%, straight talent. Yeah. So, you know, I think George is going to be fine. I think Bama, it is huge. They got to figure out who that quarterback is and they got to retool that offensive line. That was not very good this year. So Bama's got a lot of things to figure out, but that said, I think it's Georgia and Bama at the top. I think Tennessee and LSU are right there as number one, number, number two in both the East and the West. And then there's a lot of what ifs. You know, if Kentucky gets back to running that system they ran with Liam Cohen uh, two years ago and Devin Leary can execute it like like uh, Will Levis did two years ago, I think Kentucky's going to be a nice little surprise team in the East and maybe win some games they're not supposed to. 
Um, you know, South Carolina, again, you get back Spencer Radler. Can Radler play like he did the last few weeks of the season for a whole season? Because if he does, South Carolina's going to make some noise and win some games. Uh, Florida, you know, they bring in Graham Mertz from Wisconsin, who's a pretty good quarterback, but, like, he's not a world beater. So, you know, I would say the ceiling for Florida next year would be 8-4. and four. I think their fan base would take that compared to where they were just this past year. <laughs> Missouri's a tough one. I don't know if uh, if Eli Drinkwitz is is ready for, um, you know, just the SEC so tough. I know he got an extension. Clark Lee, I think, hit the ceiling at Vanderbilt. Like five and seven is is the ceiling there w- with what he has. And then the West, like, what's going to happen with Zach Arnett at Mississippi State? I think he's a great defensive coach. I think Mississippi State's going to be in a lot more defensive battles next year. They do get Will Rogers back, who... To me, I'd probably put at the top of returning quarterbacks in the SEC just production-wise. Now, how different does he look without Mike Leach calling the place? We saw the offense wasn't very good in the bowl game, albeit it was Illinois, who was a very good defensive team. Mm-hmm. Ole Miss is a mess right now. I mean, you got Quinchad Judkins, you got Jackson Dart, but, man, Lane Kiffin just had a disappointing signing day. He's going back to the transfer portal to address a lot of needs. They got to figure all that out. Arkansas's got K.J. Jefferson back, but I had somebody tell me, like, so what? You know, when I said that, he's like, so what? So what? Arkansas is going to go seven wins again? Like, I expect they're going to get better. Uh, And then there's Auburn and A&M. Auburn has, Hugh Freeze has done a fantastic job through the transfer portal recruiting. I think he's going to lay a foundation here. I think eight wins is within play for Auburn in year one. And then A&M, who the hell knows? Is Petrino (laughs) a hit or is it a not running the offense? Is it a train wreck? Well, the Aggies will go five and seven, six and six, and they're buying out Jimbo for millions and millions of dollars next season. Yeah, I agree with so much of what you just said. I, I think, I mean, obviously the biggest question for me this uh, around the SEC this entire offseason is, I mean, what the hell is Alabama going to do at quarterback, like you mentioned? Because I, I don't think it's Milrow. But if it's not Milrow, like, I mean, Ty Simpson's not played. And, and these two incoming 18-year-old freshmen, as you pointed out, I mean, like, I mean, that, that, that's a key to the keys of the castle here if you're Alabama. I mean, that 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 is that is shaky, shaky ground. So what is Alabama going to do at quarterback? Ole Miss, you kind of painted the picture there, and and Lane Kevin looked awful at the end of the season. Of course, he was, you know, will he, won't he go to Auburn and all that, but, I mean, he, he looked just just really, really, really bad there the last couple, couple of games of the season. So, I'm intrigued with all that. Um, last question, we'll leave on this. Josh Heupel, with coaches around the SEC, kind of where do you put Josh Heupel in terms of what you've seen from him so far early on in his SEC tenure with the likes of some of the better coaches in the country and, of course, in the SEC? Yeah, I think, you know, it starts with Kirby and Saban. I think Brian Kelly's in that discussion. Um, You know, if we're going right below them, I think Heupel's right there. I mean, I don't know if I go much farther. My my opinion on Jimbo has absolutely cratered these last couple of seasons. Uh, He is is one of the few coach, you know, reigning coaches who's got a a national championship under his belt, so you do have to respect that. But, you know, uh, Lane Kiffin, I've gone sour on him. Um, yeah, I, and Mark Stoops is good. Don't get me wrong for what he's done at Kentucky, I think is outstanding. But like, if we're, if we're ranking the coaches, I'm probably going to go, you know, I put Kirby one right now ahead of Saban, just cause he's won back to back championships. Yeah. Uh, I go Kirby one, I'd go Saban a close number two, one, a one B. Um, maybe I lean Brian Kelly just because he did win the West in year one. He did beat Saban in year one, albeit it was a two point conversion in overtime. Uh, and then, and then probably Hypel fourth, but I could flip flop. I could make a case for Hypel resurrecting Tennessee from the depths of hell, uh, two years ago to what they are now that he deserves to be third on that list. I could go, but to me that those are the top four, probably stoops behind him. And then some combination of Jimbo and lane. And I don't know, Hugh freeze, I think is going to climb up this list. Say what you want about Hugh freeze and the off the field stuff, but that guy can coach football. He's a good offensive mind. And, I think well, he's going he's gonna to do some damage there at Auburn, but it's going to take a little time. I think he will be successful at Auburn as well. It's hard, again, it is hard to to be bad at a place like Auburn. It really is. All right, so what, a, what a difference a, a year makes. You know, everybody was impressed with Josh Heupel last year and, and feeling good about Tennessee, but, you know, after a year 11-2, and 10-2 in the regular season, an Orange Bowl victory, I mean, expectations and – um, he's going to get a raise this offseason, deservedly so. I mean, Eli Drinkwitz is making more money than Josh Heupel right now. That is That, that can't happen. Shane Beamer is making let me, more money. Let me switch it, Eric. I'm going to put Heupel three because he beat Kelly head-to-head, and they both beat Saban. And so if I was going to justify Kelly being third, beating Saban, Heupel did too. So put, put Heupel third. Boom. There you have it. Chris Gordy, <laughs> a volunteer lover. I love that. 
All right, Chris, appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. What do you, I mean, I know you don't have a detailed plan for the next couple of days or anything, but what should uh, you know, the listeners of Locked On Balls who are now going to check out Locked On SEC, what should they be looking forward to in the coming weeks to months here in this offseason? We're going to do a lot of what we're just doing. We're going to be obviously previewing a lot of the spring ball. I mean, we've been talking tons of transfer portal news. This thing changes day to day. And there are some names that are going to change the landscape of the SEC next season. You know, granted, like somebody brought up the other day to me, they said, well, a guy getting a guy through a transfer portal just means he was a cast off. It wasn't any good at his own place. Like, yeah, yeah, but be careful. There are some really, really good players like Devin Leary, Kentucky changed the entire outcome of what, what Kentucky football is going to look like in 2023. So there are some big names. Uh, obviously, you know, look at the wide receiver spot with Tennessee. There are some big names in the portal that are going to change the dynamic for everything. So we'll be talking all that and getting you guys ready for uh, football season. And, uh, you know, we'll mix in some baseball and some basketball as well. Tennessee basketball, not so bad. Looking pretty good. So we'll be talking all that over a lot on SEC. And Tennessee baseball will likely make some more noise with that starting rotation that it has uh, coming back, all preseason All-American, so looking forward to that. Chris, appreciate it, man. Give Chris a follow on Twitter, at Chris Gordy. Thanks so much. We'll do it again. Appreciate Eric Kane. That is our crossover edition. Looking back on the Tennessee Volunteers 2022 season, we will be doing this with a couple of other locked-on hosts over the next couple of weeks, looking back on the year that was uh, for many of the teams around the SEC. Thank you guys for making us your first listen every day. Now go make your second listen. Check out the Locked On uh, College Basketball Podcast. We'll bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Here from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. It is Locked On College Basketball available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Chris Gordy. This has been Locked On SEC. Reminder, join us tomorrow. John Garcia Jr., a conversation you don't want to miss Talking all things recruiting and transfer portal around the SEC. That's tomorrow right here on Locked on SEC.